Good afternoon and welcome again to the second part of uh, this, this panel and the very, very last panel uh, of this um, conference, Arctic Futures. And um, I welcome again all the participants and I'm extremely pleased to um, have such a distinguished panel uh, where we will be discussing EU's further engagement uh, on the Arctic. I was told I don't have to uh, repeat again all the technologies, uh, only for the audience. I think it's very important to know that if you have questions to ask, that there are all kinds of possibilities after the discussions uh, to uh, still ask questions um, to the panelists, which will be uh, then uh, passed on to us uh, afterwards. Um, briefly again, I am um, Marianne Konings. Um, I have um, just finished uh, a 35 year career as a European uh, official, of which a major part dealing uh, with uh, diplomatic, uh, in a diplomatic career. I was, among others, I was the EU ambassador to Canada, where I visited extensively the Canadian uh, Arctic and my last and most um, impressive function was having been the first EU uh, ambassador uh, for the, uh, the Arctic. Our panel will be uh, discussing EU's uh, engagement uh, on Arctic affairs. I will not address the question whether further engagement of the European Union on the Arctic is indispensable because I consider that that answer is very obvious. Yes, we need a stronger engagement of uh, the European Union, not only because it's, it's obvious because of the, the current already role that the European Union is playing on Arctic affairs and particularly the key role it can play in uh, addressing major challenges that the Arctic is facing, which have global uh, implications such as climate change and sustainable development, but also because there is an increasing call upon several of EU uh, member states, Arctic member states, uh, who have been in, in recent policy papers on the Arctic insisting for a stronger European Union uh, involvement. And therefore, our discussion will mainly focus on which are the areas on which the European Union should engage more. And for those who would like to address this equally um, to uh, the if how the goals of the European Union Green Deal will be implemented uh, in um, the uh, Arctic. We have uh, for these distinguished panels, we have five panelists and we have one hour of discussion. My intention is uh, to address each panelist ask a question uh, and when we have done uh, the five panelists then one by one come back with some supplementary uh, questions so i will I, I will start with in the first place a very big thank you for the panelists for having accepted uh, the invitation to participate i will start with uh, ambassador ena uh, Gunnarsson. Uh, Einar uh, is, um, Gunnarsson is ambassador for the Arctic Affairs uh, of uh, Iceland uh, and the chair of the senior Arctic officials of the Arctic uh, Council, a very important position, particularly since uh, Iceland has currently the chair of the uh, Arctic uh, Council. And uh, I'm particularly grateful, uh, Eina, uh, for having enjoyed such an excellent cooperation and support from you and colleagues uh, when I was uh, in my previous uh, uh, activity, professional activity. Uh, Eina, my main question will be, what kind of partner uh, is the European Union to the Arctic Council? Eina, you have the floor. Yes. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, thank you, Marianne. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, of course, I would have liked to be with you in Brussels like I was last year, but this will have to do for obvi obvious reasons right now. And as to your question, uh, I would uh, maybe just like to start with uh, just re reiterating uh, what the Arctic Council is and what it is not. Uh, the Arctic Council is, of course, a forum for international cooperation between the eight Arctic states and the six permanent participants. Uh, for a forum for cooperation that is focusing mainly on environmental protection and sustainable development. 
it is as important uh, to just remind ourselves of what it is not. It is not uh, it is not a regulatory body, it is not a governing body for the Arctic. And this uh, comes up quite often, uh, but people think it is, and uh, it, it just has to be stressed. Uh, that was never the intention, it was never the ambition. Uh, the Arctic Council is dealing in knowledge and science. Uh, I remember when I said the first time to my minister, a good day in the Arctic Council is a good report. He was not very happy. Uh, he uh, is a politician that doesn't like you know, endless reports that people just put on the shelf. But that is not what we are doing in the Arctic Council with our reports. Uh, our reports, uh, the analysis and, and, and the organization of knowledge that we are uh, working on in the Arctic provides spaces uh, for policy recommendations. Uh, sometimes uh, we can even go a step further and agree on, on sort of joint action plans. And on three occasions, we have used the Arctic Council as a venue for negotiating legally binding agreements. So, uh, uh, when we look at the uh, European Union, of course, the European Union is a holder of uh, uh, vast knowledge and experience uh, on Arctic matters. And as such, uh, the European Union is very important uh, uh, for the Arctic Council. Uh, it is, of course, a de facto observer uh, providing uh, to the uh, projects, ongoing projects within the Arctic Council uh, through its working groups uh, in, in, in many ways, uh, very important ways. And, and uh, as such, uh, it is highly important uh, for the Arctic Council. But also, uh, the European uh, Union, uh, uh, when we are looking at the, at the Arctic, one should not forget its role as a regular regulator in the Arctic. Uh, uh, three of the Arctic states uh, are members of the European Union. One of them, of course, is the uh, Kingdom of Denmark, and even though two of the uh, countries that are uh, forming that part of the uh, of, or a part of that union are not members of the European Union. Uh, I think it is fair to say that the European Union uh, uh, regulatory work, legislative work, uh, is of great importance uh, for them. And then I'm referring to the Faroe Islands and, and, and to Greenland as well. And then in addition, we have Iceland and Norway, which are closely associated uh, with the Arctic community here, uh, through the EA agreement. Uh, so uh, the uh, the, Euro the European Union European Union plays a very important role when it comes to legislation uh, in these fields of its uh, uh, of its operation, which is on environmental protection and sustainable development in the Arctic. So in that sense, of course, the uh, the uh, one cannot sort of take. Well, uh, one can neither take the European Union uh, out of the Arctic or the Arctic out of the European Union, just to uh, refer to a very common phrase. Uh, if, we look at the, if we look at the policies, uh, I would uh, simply just suffice by referring to the Icelandic Chairmanship Programme, together towards a sustainable Arctic. And uh, uh, when preparing uh, uh, for this panel and, and also uh, following the very important work that the European Union is undertaking on its Arctic policy and reading about the EU Green Deal, uh, we can see uh, some very strong parallels. The focus on sustainability, uh, the understanding that the sustainability rests on three pillars. It rests, it rests on uh, environmental protection but also on economic development and social development. And you cannot really achieve sustainability without seeking a balance between the three pillars. So in that sense, uh, I think we can also see, uh, uh, sort of when it comes uh, to the policy level, a very strong uh, uh, alignment or harmony between uh, uh, the policies of the European Union and that of the Arctic uh, Council. So in sort of summing up, and uh, as uh, in, in response to your uh, uh, in response to your question, I think the European Union is a very valuable partner to the Arctic Council. Uh, it is a de facto observer uh, that holds very important knowledge and experience uh, that is uh, of great importance for the work of the Arctic Council. 
and can benefit the many projects that uh, we are cooperating with the European Union on. And uh, last but not least, it is a major regulatory player uh, in the Arctic, uh, uh, along with the, with the Arctic states. Uh, so, uh, indeed, the European Union is a very important partner uh, for the Arctic Council and the Arctic Council states and permanent participants. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Einar. Um, thank you very much for clarifying the role of uh, the Arctic Council and, and also uh, very uh, clarifying, uh, as you qualified, uh, the European U Union as a very valuable and important partner for the Arctic Council. Thank you very much. The second uh, panelist is Ms. Uh, Veronika Betz. And uh, Ms. Veronika Betz is director at DG Mari, that's the directorate general for maritime affairs and fisheries uh, of the European Commission, which is the lead director general within the European Commission dealing with uh, the Arctic. DG Mari, together uh, with the European External Action, Action Service, will be holding the pen for updating our current Arctic policy. So a very important uh, player on the Arctic file, file within the EU institutions. Um, Veronica, I don't see you on the screen, but uh, I would like to ask you the following questions. The European Union uh, has been doing a major consultation, co consultation process in view of updating uh, the Arctic um, uh, policy, which just has been uh, finalized. Uh, when I look at the Arctic policy of 2016, it was already then a very comprehensive uh, policy. So what would you say would be the major areas where further engagement of the European Union is necessary? Veronica, you have the floor. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marianne, distinguished guests, co-panelists and participants. I hope you can see me. I can see yes. myself on the yes, screen. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> so uh, let, let me first thank the organizers for giving the European Commission the possibility to be present also in the last panel of this very interesting Arctic Future Symposium. Uh, of course, being the last of the three days of discussion comes with the risk that what I will say has already been said before, but uh, I have to live with that. And indeed, uh, Anna, you are perfectly right. Uh, um, we have just closed a public consultation on our EU Arctic policy on the 10th of November with the intention to update our Arctic policy next year. And I'm happy to share some preliminary findings, but let me stress that we are still in the phase of analyzing the contributions we have received. So uh, please do not expect me as a humble civil servant to make huge announcements today on how our Arctic uh, policy will look like in the future or which areas we will cover by that policy. That's too premature. That needs further analysis and discussion in the House and also with our colleagues from the External Action Service. But let me announce you one thing, that a summary of the contributions will be made available and public early next year. So you said uh, yourself our current Arctic policy is actually not that old and it dates back only to 2016. So some may wonder why an update is actually necessary. But what uh, we have heard consistently throughout the three days of the symposium and also now just in the panel before, the stakes in the Arctic are very high. The challenges are ever increasing, be it due to the impact of climate change, increasing economic pressures or geopolitical interests. So therefore, it's really important to make our policy fit for the future and to allow the European Union to contribute in the best possible way to making the Arctic safe, stable, sustainable and prosperous. This view is also shared by our member states. Uh, you have said it also yourself uh, in the introduction of the previous panel that the member states have mandated us, the European Commission and the European Action Service, not only to continue the implementation of the current Arctic policy, but also to initiate a process in order to update the EU's Arctic policy. Let me also say one thing here that, that's important to understand. We have already achieved a lot under our current policy. So we need to establish new benchmarks and ambitions 
and this even more so in the light of the new political priorities of this Commission, and it has been mentioned many times now, notably the European Green Deal and making Europe stronger in the world. Our objective is therefore to prepare a new joint communication by the Commission and the External Action Service for the last trimester of 2021. And this communication should do a couple of things. It should take into account the development since 2016 and the experience gained with our current Arctic policy. It should provide a long-term strategic outlook for the years ahead. It should explore common Arctic solutions for innovative and sustainable development based on science and innovation and knowledge of Arctic residents. And finally, it should look into ways how to best cooperate with Arctic states, regional governments, and local and indigenous peoples. So what comes out of the public consultation, which closed just uh, three weeks ago? First, we are very pleased that a wide range of Arctic stakeholders have taken part in the public consultation from governments, international organizations, civil society, industry, business associations, research and academia, indigenous and local communities. Since many of those who have actually contributed uh, to the input in the public consultation are also attending this symposium, I would like to take the opportunity to thank all of you for your input. The replies were very comprehensive and provided useful reactions to the questions we had asked. Overall, we had uh, 140 responses. They came from 17 EU countries and 10 non-EU countries. Of all respondents, roughly 25% were European Union citizens, 25% were from academia, 16% were public authority, mainly at the regional level. And what was also good, there was a balanced participation from NGOs amounting to 10% in relation to that of business or business association amounting to 12%. What we can conclude already at this stage is that overall there is a broad support for our existing policy and its three priorities. More than 70% considered that responding to climate change and safeguarding the Arctic environment, as well as promoting the sustainable development in the region, are still relevant. And around 60% felt the need for continued strong international cooperation. Within the existing priorities, a number of respondents want continued EU support for global organizations and international processes that can contribute to addressing issues in the region, including those outside the Arctic governance framework. Various participants highlighted the potential for the European Union to advance international cooperation in areas where it has particular capabilities, such as through its space programs, research funding and scientific expertise. Some contributors also stress the need for the European Union to increase its bilateral engagement with the Arctic states. And according to many, the EU should ensure greater involvement of certain stakeholders in Arctic governance, including indigenous peoples and the Arctic business community. What we also had were calls for focusing more on particular areas, such as fostering greater connectivity, developing high level research and technology for the Arctic, and investing more in education and literacy. Some argue that energy policy, space policy, and maritime policy should feature more prominently in our approach. Research and science are clearly confirmed as being very relevant towards a common understanding and peaceful cooperation in the Arctic. And there is strong interest for many in the protection of the Arctic. That includes the view that mining in the Arctic is risky, as we have just uh, be heard before, and not desirable, and that the precautionary principle should prevail. But at the same time, there is a strong interest in the sustainable extraction of resource. But priority should be given here to the interests and the benefits of the local population, including indigenous people. Some advocated that EU addresses hard security matters, while others oppose this indigenous people. Security. So you see, uh, Marianne, we have a, a mix of opinions on many issues with sometimes conflicting objectives and positions. We will now, to have careful, caref to carefully ponder the input received, also in the light of our internal reflections and our overarching policy objectives, and as mentioned before, notably the European Green Deal. Another element that will feed our reflections for the update of our Arctic policy 
is a study on the impacts of the European Union's policy and actions on the Arctic. This will show us what worked and what not, and where gaps need to be filled. And we have also heard from uh, Mr. Pat just before that we will have a new Arctic policy resolution from the European Parliament that will, of course, also inspire our thinking. So to come to an end, uh, after some long words uh, uh, to your first question, Marianne, let me stress that in addition to our public consultation and study, such events as the events over the last two days, this Arctic Future Symposium, are invaluable source of inspiration for our reflections on what policy the Arctic needs for the future to keep the Arctic safe, stable, sustainable and prosperous. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. Uh, Veronica, um, um, many thanks uh, for sharing your insight. I found it extremely uh, useful and I like uh, your expression that we have to make our policy fit for the future. And I fully agree that the extremely rich input that uh, you have received uh, from uh, all the, the stakeholders. And also, I agree uh, with uh, the outcome of discussion during uh, this um, Futures, Arctic Futures Symposium. Uh, are uh, extremely valuable. Thank you very much. Our next uh, speaker is Mr. Thomas uh, Norval. Thomas Norval is a Norwegian politician. He is the chair of the Northland County Government and the next chair of the NSPA, the Northern Sparsely Populated Areas. Um, it seems, Mr. Norval, that Northland County wants to become the best region in Norway in which to grow up, work and live. Very ambitious. I had the occasion to visit Nordland and, and Bodo. Uh, my main question, Mr. Nordland, uh, is the following. Uh, the northern regions in the European Arctic are very dynamic and our cooperation with this region and the interregional cooperation is very important for the European Union. And I would like to ask you about the Arctic uh, paradox, what it means, and how do you believe that the European Union can contribute to resolve this issue? Mr. Novel, you have the floor. Thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me to take part in this, uh, in this very interesting panel. Um, also, thank you for your very relevant question uh, regarding the Arctic paradox, which I believe is one of the main challenges that we need to address uh, in the time to come, at least in, in my part of, uh, of Europe. Uh, I will try to explain what I mean with the Arctic paradox and why and how uh, I would argue that the EU should contribute in resolving this issue in order to develop prosperous, resilient and living society in the North. Uh, a resource paradox is often recognized as, uh, as a land that is rich in natural resources, often oil and minerals, but that still has less economic growth, less democracy and poorer development than countries with fewer natural resources. As for Norland County and other communities in the Arctic, the situation is somewhat similar to the tradi traditional understanding of a resource paradox, although with some significant differences. Uh, luckily, uh, we do not experience poorer economic numbers. However, a recent report by Business Index North says that economic growth in the Arctic does not improve the economic situation for a local population, and it's not preventing depopulation. Uh, that, uh, in my uh, um, eyes are the Arctic paradox. Uh, people that live, work and raise their children in the Arctic uh, deserves to live in modern societies. We need well-developed infrastructure, good schools, universities and of course also a rich cultural life. In my opinion, the EU's top priority should be to assist the region in overcoming the Arctic paradox, which is the demographic trend connecting to economic growth. A stable demographic development is a necessary precondition for development and also security in the Arctic region. For example, uh, the price of our salmon is high. Uh, export is going well. Still, most of the Norwegian salmon is sent abroad unprocessed. As our wood is sent to Sweden for processing and our power is sent to Denmark for the data storage centers, no offense to our neighbors in Sweden and Denmark, uh, of course. 
Uh, but if we are, and I speak from many communities in the Arctic, to gain increased value creation and increased export revenues on the basis of our raw materials, we must contribute further out in the value chain ourselves. In other words, we in the Arctic, we need to create more ourselves. Unlocking the potential of the regions requires a long-term investment commitment from the EU uh, and a continuation of fair state aid rules. Arctic regions can climb value chains through smart investments, making them able to take a further part in a fair and green development nationally and in Europe. Furthermore, the EU needs a holistic approach to promote development to attract skilled citizens to the Arctic. Uh, for our region, this, in, is, this includes support for the cultural projects like uh, European uh, Capital of Culture in Buda 2024, transport and infrastructure initiatives like the inclusion of the Port of Narvik, Ufoten Railway, and the European route E10 and E12 in the 10 t networks, and the widening of the scope of Arctic research to include social science perspectives. I think only a holistic approach can resolve the Arctic paradox. That is, despite sound economic growth and solid human development levels, demographic trends are gloomy. The EU should involve the local and regional level of governance to create extent, to, to a greater extent. Arctic regions have extensive knowledge to offer and, and on, regulation, on regulation and governing development in a sustainable direction. This is exemplified by our coastal zone management, where several industries simultaneously and sustainably partake in value creation. To ensure sustainable and resilient societies in the Arctic, an increased emphasis is needed towards social science research and local knowledge production. Through further investments in science, including citizen science, Arctic communities can be seen not only as raw material providers, but as an innovative and attractive community. And my final point, it is important that EU understand that the Arctic it's not cold, it is cool. I welcome you to visit, work and live here. Thank you all for listening. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Norvo. It was very interesting to hear about the Arctic paradox, uh, the need for a holistic approach uh, by the European Union, involvement of local and regional actors. Uh, I must say that my experience uh, when I was uh, still uh, working uh, was that uh, the role of the Nordic uh, regions uh, which have offices in Brussels uh, are extremely important. They have been doing a great, great job of giving visibility of the Nordic uh, region and particularly the North Norwegian uh, uh, office together with his uh, other partners, they told me that it was thanks to the European Union that they have been strengthening their cooperation, the Nordic, Finnish and Swedish uh, regional um, uh, cooperation. So uh, I think that we we do appreciate a lot the role uh, of the Nordic, uh, Nordic regions. I will come back to you, uh, Mr. Novel, uh, at the second round. Then uh, the next uh, speaker, the next panelist is Ms. Uh, Eileen uh, Mortensen. Uh, Eileen is the head of mission of the Pharaohs to the European Union. And um, uh, Eileen, I'm extremely pleased to have you uh, on the panel uh, today. Um, the Faroe Islands, which I had also the pleasure uh, to, to visit at the occasion of a conference on uh, the Arctic, uh, is strengthening its relations with the European Union, uh, which actually is very good news. Uh, Eileen, um, I have the following question from the perspective of a neighboring country in the European Arctic. How do you see European Union's engagement in the Arctic? Eileen, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Marianne. Um, and it's good to see you again, although it's not in person, unfortunately. Hopefully it will be sooner rather than later. And I must say it has been a very interesting afternoon to have this quite concrete discussion on the EU's role in the Arctic. And I, in particular, I thought it was very interesting to hear 
uh, Veronica's presentation on um, on the inputs that have come uh, on to on the public consultation. Um, we are very much looking forward to the update. Um, from the discussions we have about the EU's engagement in the Arctic, um, you sometimes get the impression that the Arctic is a very beautiful place but also remote and maybe a rather depressing place uh, with severe climate challenges, dwindling populations and underdeveloped resources. So I felt the urge to begin by saying that the Arctic isn't as far away as it might seem from the offices in Brussels. Mm -hmm. And while the Arctic has its challenges, it is also a thriving region. Like Mr. Norwell said, the Arctic is cool. Look at Reykjavik, look at Nuuk, look at Torsland. These are vibrant national capitals full of progress, innovation and creativity, and also at the same time with a strong sense of community and identity. These are cities where young people want to make a life for themselves and where they want to contribute to the future development of the high north. It is the Arctic countries who have the primary responsibility to ensure that the region remains a zone of peace and prosperity, and that has also been mentioned earlier today. But the EU is already making a valuable contribution to a stable and balanced development of the region. An excellent example that I wanted to highlight is the cooperation between Faroese Bank, Bank Nordic, and the European Investment Fund. They have made a guarantee agreement which allows uh, Bank Nordic to issue up to 40 million euros of new loans under more favorable conditions to innovative SMEs in the Faroes and in Greenland. And this has proven to be a highly successful initiative. From our perspective, uh, the overall priority of the EU's engagement in the Arctic should be first to continue and strengthen its active participation in the Arctic Council and its working groups, to mainstream Arctic issues into all relevant programs and funds, and to strengthen the implementation of the priorities, and also to ensure a clear and concise communication to Arctic stakeholders about the possibilities for, uh, for cooperation. But last and definitely not least, uh, Marianne, I think your um, uh, mic is on, excuse me. <laughs> Uh, I cannot put it off. That's my okay. Problem. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, but my last and the last and definitely not least, the focus should be on strengthening the partnerships with the countries in the region. Today, the formal relations between the Faroes and the EU are defined by three separate agreements on trade, fisheries and research. These agreements have significant importance for our country. And although we would like to see improvements, uh, particularly in our trade agreement, the, the cooperation is dynamic in all of them. And we also value highly our good cooperation with the external uh, action service. We work closely with the EU on international and regional fisheries management cooperation where I've also had the pleasure to work together with Veronica on several issues. And the EU remains the largest and most important market for Faroe's exports of seafood. And actually, the majority of the goods imported to the Faroes originate from the EU, with a total amount to a value of almost 1 billion euros. And the Faroe's success rate in Horizon 2020 is the highest among all participating countries in the program. And we are also very active in the Northern Periphery and the Arctic program. However, these partnerships are sectoral in nature. And the knowledge in the DGs in charge is mostly limited to the specific areas covered by the agreements. And since there is no EU delegation covering the relations with the Faroes, as Mr. Payet mentioned in his presentation, and there is no dedicated delegation in the European Parliament covering our country, the level of awareness and knowledge about the Faroes in the EU system is limited, unfortunately. This makes for a fragmented relationship that is difficult to develop and broaden. 
Therefore, the Prime Minister of the Faroes has proposed to the Commission President that they develop a cross-cutting political partnership with the aim of advancing cooperation in existing areas and exist extending it to new and emerging areas such as digitalization and renewable energy. The government is also seeking agreements with the EU to participate in Erasmus Plus and Creative Europe on an equal footing with other European countries, as we already do in Horizon. This would indeed be an excellent opportunity to further raise awareness about the Arctic on the European continent and about the European Union in the Faroes. In her response, President von der Leyen acknowledges the Faroe Islands as a strategic partner with regard to the EU's Arctic policy, and she underlines her support for enhancing the cooperation on a mutually beneficial basis. So the government of the Faroes is very much looking forward to developing a new framework for a dynamic and forward-looking relationship with the EU. And we are also looking forward to an updated EU Arctic policy. Tak Fyrin, thank you very much. Uh, Eileen for this very uh, uh, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, also mentioning uh, your participation in several of the programs, uh, what are the existing programs, and you hope that you will be able to extend it in the future. Um, uh, I, I know that you participate, and you mentioned in the Northern Periphery and Arctic uh, program of the European Union, and uh, I discovered uh, this uh, when reading uh, the Scottish uh, Scottish uh, Arctic policy, which I will recommend to everybody to read because it's it's the most, uh, I would say, a concrete uh, and comprehensive uh, text and uh, very well explained that I have been reading. Uh, last point, uh, Eileen, we might not have an EU delegation uh, in the Faroe Islands yet, but we have a very strong representation of the Faroe Islands in Brussels. Thank you. Uh, the next and last uh, speaker is Mr. Christian uh, Kelsen. Christian Kelsen is director of the Greenland Business Association. Greenland has been attracting a lot of uh, interest lately. It has been mentioned in other panels uh, and not least because of its huge economic and business uh, potential. So uh, Christian, I would like to ask you the question, uh, what are the aspects and the main challenges of a sustainable development in Greenland? Christian, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Marianne. Uh, we are feeling uh, very cool here today in, uh, in Greenland. Uh, so, so thank you for welcoming in, uh, us into the, the, the panel. <laughs> Some of the main challenges is obviously we are a nation uh, building towards a more economic uh, independence while still maintaining a, a strong cultural heritage. So we have uh, our main industry being the fisheries, accounting for 95% of our exports, uh, and the EU and uh, the UK being very um, important uh, markets in, in that aspect. Uh, the challenges are the local interests, the, the way we live, um, and how to balance uh, the, the need to be positioned on the global arena and maintain our international certifications uh, in terms of sustainable uh, fisheries and development versus uh, the needs of the local communities. Uh, first of all, we, we live on a very large uh, area in many different uh, settlements, some all the way down to only uh, 20 inhabitants. So our politicians are always close to uh, the stakeholders, to the population here. This calls for uh, some challenges in, in terms of how uh, the resources are, are managed. Um, we are on, a, on, the, on the route to uh, more economic uh, independence, trying to find a way uh, in the world, uh, finding uh, sources of income and moving from a current economy standing on, on mainly one pillar in addition to the, the block grant of, of, uh, of Denmark, to four uh, pillars moving into industries such as mining and tourism. It's a process of uh, modernization. And uh, the, the challenges again being, how do we manage a, a, a country uh, this size, living in so many different places, and maintaining a, a lifestyle uh, that's conform with the, with the modern world, while 
at the same time maintaining uh, our uh, cultural heritage uh, in terms of uh, how uh, the resources are, are managed. We are, uh, as mentioned, a small uh, population, but a big issue in terms of working uh, long term is uh, the loss of competencies. We have a workforce that rotates quite well in and out of the country. We have people that are in their positions for only a short while, and most of our initiatives uh, work uh, short term rather than long term. And, and working on sustainability, to me, is a, a long term development, which is uh, more of a, a strategy rather than just uh, tactics. But with the, the current resources available and the competencies available uh, to our country, we are working more short term rather than uh, long term. Uh, obviously, looking at the industries that are uh, affected by uh, the agenda, uh, the fisheries is our main industry, but the effects of how the fisheries is, 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 uh, is handled affects other businesses, especially our tourism. Uh, there's a strong demand for sustainable travel, and we are a growing tourism nation, but we are highly affected by how the energy, waste management, and, and fisheries are, are handled. Uh, also, in, in Greenland, we have huge investments in uh, the infrastructure, uh, building new airports, um, trying to enable greener solutions when transporting ourselves and goods around the country and to and from the country. But it's a small market, and with small scale comes uh, challenges and difficulties in making larger investments, which uh, over time uh, will, be, uh, will be greener. So uh, to, to, to sum it up, um, trying to maintain a culture in a, in a modern world, moving towards uh, economic independence and finding the resources and competencies to support this uh, seems to be some of the challenges uh, in the sustainable uh, agenda. Thank you very much. Challenges. I will come back to you also with some supplementary uh, questions, particularly regarding the uh, the, the challenges. And uh, we now will do. Uh, we have still some time available uh, to do the supplementary uh, questions. And I will start uh, with Einar uh, again. Einar, are you still there, Einar? Einar, I'm here. Okay. Thank oh. you. Um, Anna, allow me to put you a very provocative question. Um, I'm not anymore on function, so I can allow to do this. The European Union uh, is an Arctic entity. Uh, even um, EU countries like Sweden says in its very latest uh, Arctic policy that the European Union is part, that the Arctic is uh, part of the European Union that the European Union is part of the European Arctic. So my question would be, would it then not be more normal that we will be seeking for membership instead of an observership at the Arctic Council? Well, that's a very interesting uh, question, but I actually think that that question would probably uh, be more of an internal uh, question uh, for, uh, for the European Union, because uh, I think it would be uh, hard to envisage uh, that there would be sort of a double representation uh, of the same areas. Uh, so the question would then be uh, maybe similar to what we have seen uh, in other international organizations, for example, like uh, at the UN, uh, when the question is really who is speaking uh, on behalf uh, of, the, uh, of the European Union or its member states. Uh, so. Uh, 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 I think that would probably be the uh, be the first question because it could possibly uh, sort of uh, at the same time undermine the position of the of the three uh, Arctic states. And let's not also forget it that one of them, uh, uh, as as we just heard now, you know, both from uh, from Elin and, and and Christian, you know, uh, one of them is a a, a, a kingdom uh, representing uh, three countries uh, two out of. Uh, uh, out of which are uh, sort of Arctic in a sense, uh, and 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 may uh, hold sort of the 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 uh, 
the uh, uh, strongest claim to sort of the Arctic colors uh, of, of, of that Arctic uh, of that Arctic state. Uh, so uh, all in all, I think uh, uh, it's a very interesting question, but probably not one for the chair of the senior <laughs> Arctic officials to be very outspoken uh, uh, to be very outspoken of. But just in conclusion, let me tell you one thing, uh, uh, Marianne. I, I, I always thoroughly enjoyed when we were dealing with Arctic affairs uh, together in, 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 in different parts of the world. Uh, you have uh, you were always a very uh, strong representative of the uh, of the European uh, Union, uh, but you were never provocative, uh, at least <laughs> at least not in a negative way. So uh, thank you very much. This is an that. attempt of an answer. <laughs> I appreciate your answer very much. I know it was a provocative uh, question, but it, the answer that you gave uh, is something to really to think about uh, the implications. I, I I want to to maybe finish uh, my my conversation with a dialogue with you, Aina, for for thanking you for the big effort uh, that you are doing to strengthen the engagement of uh, observers. Uh, in the Arctic Council, which includes the European Union. And, and I know also that it has been publicly said, as my, my successor, Michael Mann, uh, the new EU ambassador, also has been, is appreciating the, uh, this a lot. So I, I would say that I could speak uh, on behalf of all the observers of the Arctic Council. Uh, um, a big thank you, and please continue in that, in that uh, way. Thank you very much. Thank you for the very comprehensive uh, overview of the first reactions uh, on the new updated uh, Arctic uh, policy. Uh, my question is, uh, we have this new update and at the same time we have the implementation of the, the Green Deal. Now, how, how do you see that uh, the, the Arctic policy could reinforce uh, the implementation of the, of the Green Deal itself? Will the specific parts which are related to the Arctic? Yeah, Thank, uh, thanks, uh, Marianne. And uh, let me tell you that I'm happy you didn't ask me the question about the membership of the European <laughs> Union in the Arctic. <laughs> I'm glad I do not have to reply to that. Uh, uh, so you asked me about the European Green Deal, how it's going to be implemented in the Arctic, what does it mean in this context? And maybe just for everybody to understand what this is about, I, I'd like to explain shortly what the European Green Deal is. So the European Green Deal is the top political priority of the van der Leyen Commission. It's, uh, so to say, our sustainable growth strategy. And what we want for our continent, what we want for the European Union here is that there are no net emissions of greenhouse gases in 2050, that the natural capital is protected, that economic growth is decoupled from resource use, and that all this is achieved through a just and inclusive transition. Yeah? So the European Green Deal uh, therefore covers a wide range of priorities, which are all of direct relevance to the Arctic, such as tackling climate change, protecting and restoring biodiversity, a zero pollution ambition, or moving towards a circular economy. The COVID crisis, by the way, has not really lowered our ambitions. In the contrary, what we want is building back better. So from what I've said, I think it's clear that there are parallels between the objectives and headlines of the European Green Deal and the challenges and interests that need to be addressed in the Arctic. And I can say also that both are the European Green Deal and the Arctic, they need the same ingredients. They need research and innovation, they need sustainable investment, they need balance between conservation and sustainable use, they need investment in people and cooperation in all respects. How the future EU Arctic policy will implement the European Green Deal concretely? I'm afraid that's a bit too early to say, but it is clear what we will propose with the update of our Arctic policy will be consistent with the objectives and priorities of the European Green Deal. When we will craft our Arctic policy, we will do this through the prism of the European Green Deal. I'd like also to make a distinction between what the European Union can do in the European Arctic through its regulatory competencies and what the European can do more widely by acting globally. Einar has stressed this very much, that the European Union has an important role as a regulator for the European Union's Arctic member states, and that extends also to Norway and Iceland under the European Economic Area. 
What I also wanted to emphasize in reply to the question is that the European Green Deal as such will already have a positive impact on the Arctic region and that beyond the European Union boundaries. Uh, and I'd like to give a couple of examples uh, for that. So first, we have climate. We have the climate uh, change uh, actions. So our actions to curb climate change at home and abroad are the best investment we can do for the Arctic, since the Arctic is hit harder by climate change. We have already put our political commitment to climate neutrality into law. We are climate proofing our policies, such as energy, industry, and food. We have just launched our plans and targets for expanding renewable offshore energy. And we will spend 30%, this is more than half a trillion of the European Union's budget over the next seven years, on climate mitigation and adjustment. And all this will have a direct and tangible impact also on the Arctic. Then, uh, as another example, with regard to environment, as for climate here, our ambitions for the protection of the marine environment is laid down in the Biodiversity Strategy 2030, will have an impact on the Arctic. This strategy does not only set commitments and targets for the European Union, but it calls also for global cooperation to halt biodiversity loss. A key ambition, for instance, here is to turn 30% of the sea into marine protected areas within the European Union and outside. Another very important milestone in that strategy which is of relevance for the Arctic high seas, will be the conclusion of the high seas treaty on marine biodiversity, the so-called BBNG treaty. And my last example uh, that I wanted to bring in this context is uh, about research and innovation. The European Union will invest massively in research and innovation and science cooperation to achieve the objectives of the European Green Deal and the Green Transition. This means that the European Union will remain a major funder and coordinator for Arctic polar research, as we have been doing in the past, where we have spent, uh, I think, around 200 million euros in Arctic-related research over the last six years. And we will also further strengthen our Earth observation space systems. And I, I, I can safely say here that these technologies and the, the services they deliver offer concrete solutions to communities in the region and help us better understand the impacts of climate change in the region. So you can see if we deliver on the European Green Deal, we deliver on the Arctic as well. But you can also be sure that our new Arctic policy will even become greener than before, and our new Arctic policy will help making the Arctic cool, as Thomas said. So I hope this explains a little bit uh, how we see the European, the connection between the European Green Deal and the Arctic. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Veronica. I liked very much uh, uh, you know, the slogans that, that you used and, and also uh, pointing to the parallels which are uh, between the Green Deal and, and the Arctic uh, file. And uh, thank you for giving also uh, visibility and explanation to the important goals and ambitions of the Green Deal, which, as you said, will also profit uh, the Arctic. Um, Mr. Uh, Thomas Noval, you will be uh, the next chair of the uh, NSPA, the Northern Sparsely Population uh, Area. Uh, I think that maybe it might be useful as a next chair of the NSPA, maybe to uh, her to uh, list to, to interest. It will be interesting to hear more about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, the NSPA cooperation, that is, of course, as you know, it is the, the, the northernmost region in, uh, in Norway, Sweden and Finland working together. And uh, thank you for, uh, for um, uh, earlier giving um, your, giving, um, uh, your um, uh, well, well tell, telling how, how you uh, have, uh, have uh, seen the, uh, the uh, North Norway or the Nord Nordic uh, offices in Brussels and how they work. We are... Uh, in the middle of the budget process, where one thing we are discussing is how we're going to fund them. So it is uh, it is good to hear that they have made an, uh, an impression. Uh, the NSP network, it is it is really very well functioning. And what we have seen is, well, as a non-member state, uh, it is uh, that it is important to, to cooperate with our neighbors that are a part of the EU, because we see that we have lots of interests in, in common. Uh, for instance, uh, if you look at the uh, what you call it, the uh, the uh, 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 state aid rules. 
um, um, even though if you look at northern Norway and northern Sweden, uh, it might look not the same, uh, but but we have many of, of the same and uh, the same uh, challenges. And the Arctic paradox, of course, is is valid for all of these uh, regions. Uh, so, for instance, the the work uh, that that we did together uh, about having the possibility to have a lower employers tax uh, in uh, in northern Norway. Uh, if we did not have the NSA network, that would not have been possible um, because it is a decision that is also taken in, in the EU. So this is going to be, be really, uh, really important for uh, for us. Uh, and, and we also tried to kind of show that, uh, well, as, as Elin Mortensen said, um, that the Arctic, it is not that remote. Uh, we see now that uh, European industry is uh, investing in, in northern Norway. They invest because of the, the hydropower, because of the minerals that are there. Uh, we see that uh, Chinese construction companies uh, are establishing themselves in the area because of the, the building of railways, roads uh, and bridges. And we see that both American and Asian capital uh, are investing in the seafood industry. But what is important, and that is both in northern Norway, but also in Sweden and, and Finland, uh, is that we have to ensure that this is not just an area for uh, for the production, uh, but that we can be an, a place for development, a, a place where people would like to live their lives. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that if, if we work together in this region, uh, we, we really hope that we could, could make, an, uh, make an, an effort in that direction. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Novel. Um... I, I always have been saying in, in, my, in my speeches when uh, when you speak about the, the Arctic uh, to a non-expert publicum, they they think it, the Arctic is about uh, uh, iceberg, it's about uh, beers on uh, on uh, uh, on ice, and uh, but the image does not come to mind that uh, especially the European Arctic is uh, a place where you have vibrant communities, cities, uh, industrial parks, uh, you have uh, universities. And uh, I will never forget that I uh, visited uh, the industrial park in uh, near Bordeaux in Mo, uh, if I pronounce it well, and uh, which is an example of a sustainable industrial uh, de development. And uh, I think I, I also mention it uh, always when, when you speak about uh, the very, very positive developments in, in, in the north. And, and therefore, uh, you have a very important task to continue the intention, uh, the attention uh, on the important role uh, of the of the Nordic regions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Norval. Thank you. Uh, Eline, um, you have been touching upon so many uh, questions already. Um, maybe uh, just one specific question, additional question. How do you see that the European Green, Green Deal uh, affect uh, the, uh, could affect the Faroe Islands? Yeah, thank you very much, Marianne. Well, although the Faroes are outside of the EU and, and we are not covered by the acquis, um, there's no doubt that the EU's ambitions for a green transition will, will affect us both directly and indirectly. As you all know, um, the climate change is more severe in the Arctic and it's not caused by pollution that is originating from the region itself. So if the EU manages to limit its emissions substantially, this will have a positive effect. Uh, and also being a global power, the EU does lead by an example in international negotiations. Um, in the Faroe Strait, a green transition, uh, it's well underway. And, and we do look to the EU uh, when we legislate and establish uh, standards, uh, just as uh, Einar Gunnarsson uh, mentioned as well. Uh, in the Faroes, one of the goals is that uh, all electricity production should be based on renewable energy in 2030. And today, around 50% of the production is already green. And there are numerous projects ongoing on hydropower, wind energy, um, biogas production, and, and, a, and a lot of diff other different things. Um, uh, one of the most recent projects, uh, which has high prospects, and they have just started to su supply electricity to the to the national grid is an innovative project which is supported by Horizon 2020 on tidal energy. 
It's a collaboration between the Swedish company Minesto and the Ferries Electricity Supply CF. Um, and being a small scale and fully at the same time fully fledged society with industries and a long range of activities and, and an isolated power grid, uh, the Fair Islands are ideal as a testbed for uh, innovative solutions. And, and we are very interested in a closer cooperation uh, with the EU in this sector. There was one other subject I thought to touch upon. It was also mentioned briefly by, by Thomas Norway, Norwell and also by Anu Fredriksen on, on the links between uh, trade policy and, um, and the Green Deal and the Arctic. Um, from our point of view, the EU ought to take a closer look at, um, at the access for fisheries goods from the Arctic to the EU. In a few years, uh, there will be no tariffs on fisheries goods from countries far away like Japan and, home, and hopefully the Mercosur countries. Well, very few changes have happened to the access for seafood product, products from the European North. Um, and these are sustainably, uh, sustainable and healthy sources for food um, from the shortest distance possible. And it's produced from by very close partners to the EU. So we think that this should have a high priority when discussing the European Green Deal. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Eileen. It's very interesting remarks again. Um, I, I was a little bit puzzled about your, your comment on the fisheries because uh, I thought that about 50% of fisheries imports in the European Union comes from, from, from the Arctic, from the European Arctic. Uh, so 50% is, is, is quite, uh, quite a lot. Um, but uh, this is uh, definitely uh, uh, a development which has to be uh, taken uh, into account. And maybe if some of the fishery grounds of the current EU fishers might be closed in the near future, maybe there might be some potential to going more north. Uh, thank you very much again, uh, Eileen, and keep up your excellent work uh, in, uh, in, in Brussels. And again, last but not least, um, uh, Christian, uh, you gave a good overview about the sustainable development. Maybe if you could say a few words more about um, which are the main industries in, um, in Greenland that need to address, address sustainability. And I particularly also would like you to answer on the question, uh, that, uh, there is this enormous mining possibility in uh, a potential in Greenland. And when you speak about mining potential, we heard it in the previous um, panel also, there are quite a lot of concerns, including from the local and the indigenous population about, uh, is it possible to have um, green mining uh, taking place? Um, and a related question, uh, you are population in Greenland about something more, but I might be wrong, uh, 50,000 and more uh, inhabitants. So if you have this enormous potential and prospects of industrial and economic uh, development, uh, uh, will you have sufficient uh, local workforce uh, to deal with it? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, and I'll start with the, with the latter question, really. Uh, we are 56,000 people here uh, in the total, uh, in total, and, and to, to answer the question whether we have a, a, a sufficient workforce, it's, it's, it's going to be no. Um, at this current point, without any further development, we are still uh, lagging behind in a competent workforce, so we're very much relying on, uh, on expats uh, to come in, and, and that's one of the issues, because it's 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 difficult to sustain competencies and, uh, and knowledge and experience uh, with a, a workforce that uh, rotates fairly often. Uh, on top of that, we actually have a, a de facto uh, uh, decrease in, in the total population. Um, the net effect is that people are moving from Greenland. And, and the way it goes is that people move from a smaller settlement to a larger town uh, eventually moved to Nuuk and then from Nuuk uh, out of the country usually to, to Denmark. So we also have what you could call a, a brain drain. Um, we haven't solved the issues with the, with the workforce at this point. Uh, obviously what we are hoping is that it, that should be uh, hit it big with the mining industry, that that would create jobs. 
the flip side to that is uh, often the people needed in that industry uh, will come from other industries in, within our country, leaving them uh, bare in terms of, of the workforce. So that's just going to create other problems. Um, also, with the development and the mobility in the workforce, uh, the types of jobs within the mining industry may not suit the, the local population. So we'll have to find a, a mix of building competency in country uh, to service the mining industry and work within that industry, uh, and at the same time, not leaving everything else uh, uh, to rest, trying to develop uh, other industries as well, uh, while maintaining the jobs that are all already here and uh, provide the services um, that are needed to, to maintain a society. Uh, so that was that was kind of touching upon that point uh, with the workforce. Uh, in terms of the mining industry, that that's been an ongoing for many many years, uh, and it's um, we have some activity, uh, especially in the exploration phase. We've got thirty nine active licenses here at the moment, um, so we haven't got any large scale mines uh, for real at the moment. We we are closer now than we've been for for many years. Uh, but one of the big issues, obviously, is is, uh, is, um, is the workforce. Another one is uh, the infrastructure to support it. Some of the positive things that could come with a mining industry is the need for energy. This could actually mean that we will have to put up more hydro plants, more uh, solar uh, panel driven uh, energy, and so on. So things that could come with these industries because of their needs that could also benefit uh, the local communities. And I find that Greenland has been fairly good at negotiating the deals with the companies in terms of what's needed uh, in place uh, once you set up shop in Greenland. And uh, that brings me to the first uh, question to finish off with that. What industries are uh, affected by sustainability? And obviously the, the, the aspiring mining uh, industry will be very much uh, affected by this agenda. I think that's a, a global phenomenon. Uh, obviously, as well, the fisheries maintain our certificates, maintain a sustainable fisheries for the generations to come. <clears throat> the, the touch over is into tourism, for instance. Also, our infrastructures, uh, the airports and harbors, and uh, the investments in, in the fleet uh, need to look into the sustainability as well, uh, and the solutions that are available there. And uh, last but not least, uh, energy. Uh, because of the way we live today with many smaller settlements, we have uh, reliance on older technology, uh, very much fuel-based energy. And we need to move more towards uh, hydro plants, uh, hydropower, and solar energy. And uh, we have uh, quite a few uh, hydro-powered uh, stations at the moment, and that's a development that we're moving towards. But often making a large investment in a hydro plant that only uh, services a very small area is, is a difficult investment to make. Um, yeah, so 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 in conclusion, um, we have an issue with the workforce. We uh, have some uh, some challenges uh, when it comes to sustainability across most sectors. And uh, we are uh, obviously a, a community that is, is, is um, for and against as any other society. We have uh, people opposing and people that are supporting uh, a mining industry. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Christian. Um, I, I know that already now the European Union is supporting uh, Greenland. Uh, our uh, support has been focused uh, a lot, for example, on supporting the education sector. Uh, in, in Greenland, and I, I really hope also that with all the developments taking place in Greenland, particularly uh, in the economic field and investment, that we also will be able to support and, and share experience uh, in developing sustainable and green um, business and industrial opportunities. And I wish you uh, a lot of luck. Thank you, Christian. Thank you very much. Okay, Josef, we have come to the end of the round of this panel. I don't know if there is time uh, for uh, more questions or if there have been uh, questions. If not, I will be concluding this panel. Josef? Jacob, he, he may have one question if there's time. Yes. Can you formulate a question, please? Yeah. Hi. 
Um, the question was, do you think the model of international multi-level and multi-stakeholder governance structures in the Arctic, it is the Arctic Council and Bering Sea Arctic Council, etc., can be exported as a model to other parts of the world? To who is this question directed? Aina, would you would like to uh, answer this question? Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to comment, and, and uh, I think uh, uh, that the model that we have on Arctic uh, cooperation uh, is actually noteworthy and, and, and could be used elsewhere. And in that uh, context, I think maybe what really sets the Arctic Council apart is the importance uh, of our permanent participants, the representatives of the indigenous populations. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that is a wonderful example on, on how to uh, relate with a group that uh, uh, should have a much stronger voice also in other fora. Uh, so maybe that would be the one particular wisdom, I, could, I would say that we could take out of the Arctic Council and, and maybe apply in a, in, in a wider setting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then I will wrap up for the, the panel and I want to express a, a big, big thank you uh, to all the contributions from the panelists. Uh, I can note that uh, there is a support for further engagement for the, of the European Union in, in the Arctic, that the contributions and achievements already now of our current Arctic um, our policy uh, are valued and appreciated, and there are expectations uh, that we should even do more and better in full participation and partnership with the many stakeholders, and uh, not uh, at least uh, also with strongly uh, engaging with the people of uh, the Arctic. I would say that uh, the input that we got from these panels and particularly also uh, the consultation process uh, are particularly important uh, for the European Union, uh, for our colleagues who will uh, now drafting um, the updated EU uh, uh, policy. And I would say that we will do it uh, with the words of Veronica uh, to make the EU Arctic policy fit for the future. So with these words, I would uh, like and close uh, this, this panel uh, discussion and before uh, handling the, the final word to, uh, to Joseph, because this has been the last panel, uh, I uh, would uh, like uh, to thank especially uh, Joseph and all the colleagues who have been setting up this Arctic Future uh, Symposium. Uh, it has been maybe organized in more difficult circumstances, uh, but uh, the richness of the discussions uh, proved uh, once again uh, the very, very uh, important uh, um, the, uh, the value of the Arctic uh, Futures um, Symposia, uh, which brought a lot of uh, most interesting participants and also uh, con contributions, which certainly will be uh, an uh, in inspiration. Um, I uh, want to thank uh, for the successful um, uh, for the successful symposium and also uh, wishing uh, all the the participants, uh, the audience, the organizers uh, a very healthy and safe end of the year and a very very uh, best wishes for the new year and and hope. Uh, that we will see you uh, all uh, in the new year. So best wishes for you, your families, for the Arctic and uh, for the people living in the Arctic. Thank you very much.